Welcome to this year's Docs Equinox program running online at Hamptons DocFest from April 22nd, which happens to be Earth Day, through Sunday, April 25th. I'm Jackie LaFaro, founder and executive director of the Hamptons DocFest. Over these four days, we're celebrating Mother Earth in a big way with three highly illuminating environmental documentary films, all with Q&As with directors and guests that shed a clear light on the human connection to our planet. We have a special panel for you, our conversation centerpiece with inspiring local echo advocates, and they're the new keepers of our planet. I'd like to introduce our local East End Green team of environmental activists who'll share their thoughts and ideas and action plans, not only for the planet, but for our local neighborhoods. A warm welcome to Scott Bluedorn, local artist, who sits on the East Hampton Energy and Sustainability Committee, Daniela Cronmeyer, a national indigenous rights consultant, John Robertson, landscape manager at Wainscott Farms, Alexandra Talty, award-winning international journalist on agriculture and social justice, and Shane Weeks, Shinnecock Nation artist and educator. They are in a centerpiece conversation moderated by WLIW 88.3 FM radio host Gianna Volpe. We hope you'll hear some helpful takeaway tips, not only to help Mother Earth and our planet, but to take back to the local community. So we thank you for listening. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I would love for each of you to talk about what are the biggest challenges facing the protection of air, water, and land on the East End, starting with Alexandra. Thank you so much for having us. Um, you know, growing up on the East End, I think all of us have seen a lot of changes in the past 30 years. And when we're talking about the biggest issues, you know, facing the environment out here, I think the number one is water quality, which is something that is a bit ironic. We're surrounded by water everywhere, but at the same time, that also means that our groundwater is very close to the surface. And we have overdeveloped a lot of regions on in Suffolk County on Long Island. And just now we're starting to realize the consequences of this. You know, the Peconic Bay Estuary is a federally recognized one. And there it's, you know, we have these occurrence, these rust tide, they used to be a once in a lifetime occurrence and now they're happening every year. So I think that's something that we all treasure out here and something that we all kind of need to think about in our actions and, you know, in our outreach. Can you build on that, Shane? Yeah, sure. I think um, one of the biggest challenges is um, awareness and awareness in how our, our actions every day, um, individually and as a whole community, have an impact. How those how those impact the uh, the environment, and I think um, some people just aren't aware of of how our interactions with the, the environment every day um, affects us and future generations going on into the future. What about you, Scott? Um, yeah, I, I would agree that there's um, multiple problems and a lot of them are very intersectional. So uh, and that relates to people, planet, and uh, the environment that we all call home. Uh, development is a huge issue, I think, overdevelopment last couple of decades has accelerated a lot of problems that are really coming to a critical juncture now, uh, and we're seeing those. Um, and that includes uh, water quality being a huge one, um, uh, but also um, degradation of soil is another huge problem. Uh, this is an agricultural, a prime agricultural region, uh, overfishing of our waters. Um, there's a lot of intersectional problems. So John, as far as agriculture is concerned, can we talk a little bit about landscaping and um, the organic approach? Yeah, and uh, when it comes to our soils, um, you know, Wayne Scott Farms and myself really like implementing the organic land practices that benefit like our entire ecosystem out here. Um, we like to, we want to prevent pollution in the surrounding water tables and then increasing the soils in, in a long-term thing. And that's what organic practices really do. 
You know, uh, since, since we're going so well here, let's just roll into our actual uh, personal questions. So you, John, what can individuals do to minimize the impact on the local environment when pertaining to lawn and landscape care? Yeah, uh, I think that, you know, a big thing is the energy use and affecting the climate change out here. Critical issues are, um, you know, we need to minimize the use of fossil fuels, which the town of East Hampton has actually very recently just, you know, set regulations on using gas powered leaf blowers and stuff uh, through the summer months. I think it's March 20th to through Labor Day. Um, other methods uh, include, you know, using just native plants and and organic approaches to your lawns and to your gardens. Um, I just, you know, all of these pesticides and fertile and you know synthetic uh, synthetic fertilizers, sorry, um, are just really, you know, seeping into these water tables and killing us. So. Uh, I wanted to go to Danielle uh, Cronenbeier and ask her, we didn't talk about uh, some of the, her thoughts on the challenges facing our air, land, and sea here on the East End. So I wanted to hear those thoughts as well as what ways that individuals can get more involved with local organizations to help the environment. Well, I agree with what everyone else said. I think development is our number one issue here because it just kind of expands on everything related to uh, the land, the air quality, water quality. Um, I would say the most important thing right now is our community coming together. I think we all really need to be having these conversations regularly. I am so pleased to be a member of the environmental networks out here. We have so many incredible organizations um, from the group for the East End, Peconic Baykeeper, Peconic Land Trust, um, different organizations that work directly with wildlife and refuges to dedicate space to our wildlife, which is, you know, we're slowly encroaching on their space with all the development going on. And I think that through the arts um, and through, you know, the Shinnecock Nation and working together through all these different wonderful communities we have out here, we can have interesting conversations and come up with solutions together. I know with the Southampton Art Center, um, we're currently programming a wonderful exhibit called Earth, Artists as Activists, that Scott is going to be um, one of our artists being featured, but we're, we're working with all those organizations to bring these conversations together. And I think the most important thing is that people out here can start connecting and realizing that we have such a wealth of arts and writing networks. If you have a skill, use it and bring it toward making our environment better. Shane, as an indigenous person, what is the most significant impact you've seen on the local ecosystem? Well, I think it starts out with the disconnect I've seen in our communities, um, almost nationally, from the environment. And I think that, um, you know, it, it goes back to an old traditional teaching um, in, our, in our ways. And what it says is all of my relations. And in saying that, in our language, one man in Tom Belt, and in saying that, you're acknowledging our connection to all of creation. And that what one thing uh, in creation that always affects the other thing in creation. And so what I'm seeing is that, um, like our waterways, for instance, you know, when, when we pollute our waterways, it directly affects us, whether we acknowledge it or see it uh, or not. And one example that I like to use is that almost all of the south, southern bays on Long Island, um, particularly Shinnecock, uh, the Shinnecock Reservation, our eastern border is all mussels uh, with seagrass, the rib mussels with seagrass. And over the last several years, um, the waters have become so polluted that our mussels are degrading. And that's pretty much the only thing holding our eastern border together from erosion. And if we start losing those, that border, um, eventually Shinnecock will become eroded as well and we'll have to, to take action about that. But it can be pre prevented with awareness and um, acknowledgement of the things that we're doing to cause that erosion and the death of, of those animals and that those marine resources. Do you think the replanting or the planting of oyster reefs through the pandemic is one way that we've helped kind of stem the tide? 
I think that's that's one way to put a Band-Aid on it. Mm-hmm. You know, Shinnecock, our, our reservation has been planting oysters on our part of Shinnecock Bay since the 70s, you know, and our, our part of the bay remains the, the cleanest part of Shinnecock Bay um, to this day. But I think that overall, the, the nitrogen and those pollutants that are going into the water, that's still going to be a detriment, um, even with the oysters. You know, you could, the oysters can only do so much. Scott, do you want to build on that a little bit and just talk about other ways that people on a personal level can benefit the environment around them? Um, yeah, there's a lot of things that people can do on their own uh, to, to try to better what they, uh, what they can contribute, I think, to our environmental situation. Um, you know, and, and it, it includes a lot of things like energy efficiency in your home is a huge one. Um, that includes, you can actually get an audit from a number of companies that will uh, figure out how much energy you're using and figure out, you know, what the, where the losses are and how you can eliminate those. Um, it means driving less. It means buying less. It means uh, if you garden, you know, using um, as little fertilizer as possible, um, nitrogen-based fertilizer. Um, and John will speak about more on that. Um, you know, using plastic. Um, disposable plastic is huge. And now we are all walking around and seeing gloves and masks and things discarded on the ground. And that is, again, because there's so many uh, additional people here and the land can only bear so much. Um, and then also to build on um, uh, what we were talking about with oysters is the fact that kelp farming is right on the horizon now. Uh, and where before it was not a an actual permitted use, but for those who don't know, kelp is this amazing seaweed that um, is not only a great uh, nutritional food, but it, it also cleans the water. Uh, it sequesters nitrogen and carbon, and um, it can actually become a, a useful product in a lot of different things like cosmetics, fertilizers, uh, the good kind of fertilizer, I should say, <laughs> and, uh, and it has a lot of promise. So that's something that people can actually support is uh, once this uh, becomes a permanent thing that people can actually get behind it and create um, a new equitable uh, and sustainable bioregenerative industry for our region. Very cool. I did not know that. And I'm really excited about it, especially knowing how much our oysters, for example, uh, filter the waters around us and keep it clean or clean it up as it were. Alexandra, bring us back to the land and talk about some other ways that homeowners here on the East End can promote environmental initiatives on their property. Are we looking at unlawning type of situations here? That I know is definitely something that um, has become a word that people are more familiar with. Um, I know, John, it sounds like you guys do a lot of work around, you know, re-promoting native species. Um, And, you know, there's a rule two thirds for the birds. So thinking about making sure that you are not just planting things, you know, to look pretty or to walk on. But honestly, the biggest thing that a homeowner can do is to find out about your septic system It's not a really sexy topic by any means of the imagination, but we're the largest unsewered um, area in the country. And I'm working on a story about this for The Guardian right now. And it's a real crisis. And it's, we have 380,000 just basically traditional cesspools um, across Suffolk County. Um, And right now there's a rebate program where you can, the county will help you. There's people you can work with, advanced wastewater solutions, Um, And they will find you money, they will help design a septic system, and they will put it in. And it is probably one of the best things, if you own your house, like find out what kind of system you have and try to fix it. Because that is the biggest pollutant, you know, talking about oysters and Shane's talking about the pollution in Shinnecock, 70% of the pollution in our waters is from the nitrogen in our groundwater, which is wastewater. So that's, I would say, the kind of big banner Uh, for homeowners at least. That's absolutely right. I'm so grateful that you talked about that. It's something that was really front and center when the pandemic was really getting going. The smart septics were the big topic and everyone was getting them put in and the pandemic sort of, you know, shut everything down. Um, So I'm very, very grateful that we got to talk about that. So John, do you want to talk a little bit more about what is unwanting? 
So um, many of our clients think, you know, um, their lawns have to be these beautiful, bright green, you know, pasture type things. But, um, and they also think that it becomes, um, you know, more plantings equals more maintenance, which is not really the case because, you know, uh, maintaining when you're unlawning and you're putting in more native plantings and, um, you know, plantings around, around the property, um, you are, when you are maintaining those, you're just using, you know, it's more hand pruning and, um, and stuff that, and perennials that, you know, you cut once a year or twice a year, um, but you're not, you know, pruning them like boxwoods and keeping, keep, keeping them so tedious, uh, which, you know, also leads to more emissions going out of, um, you know, hedge trimmers, etc. cetera. But, um, you know, and it, it really is, it's, you know, it's, it's deeper roots and it's going more into the water table when you're planting more, um, stir, you know, more plants rather than keeping and maintaining a lawn and mowing it all the time. Not to mention the fact that it's providing food for the local uh, ecosystem. I, I, I remember speaking to someone years ago and they were talking about how a green lawn is like a desert for the little critters that are in the area. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so Daniela, can we talk a little bit or hear a little bit more about this Earth exhibit and what's going on at Southampton Art Center? Sure, we're really excited about this exhibit. It um, is going to debut on April 17th. It will run through July 11th. And we're going to feature many local uh, East End artists who are also environmental activists working in different mediums. Uh, we're also going to have a wonderful programming series where we'll have outdoor documentary films on the lawn. You can bring your own beach chair and blanket. We will also have interesting panel discussions and talks and workshops um, revolving around all the issues we kind of covered on in this conversation. So be sure to check out everything going on at the Southampton Art Center. But, you know, with the environment being such a big topic these days, I, I know that all of our art institutions are, are doing wonderful programming related to it. And I would just encourage people, you know, whether you've been in the community a long time or new to the community, if you have a passion about something to do with the natural world, there's a very good chance that you'll find um, a nice little family here of people working on that project. Um, everyone on this panel for sure uh, is involved in some capacity, but there's just countless wonderful organizations. You can volunteer your time, you can make fiscal donations to, or you can, you know, volunteer your skill set, um, which we all, we all really appreciate. Thank you so much to all of the panelists and all of you for joining us here on the East End Green panel. Hoping that everyone listening and watching got at least one thing that they can take with them to basically give them an idea about how to take one small step to better our local environment here on the East End. Thank you so much for joining us, and don't forget to check out the films on HamptonsDocFest.com.